news and some sad news. So um, tell us, Andrew, what's exciting, first of all? Oh, it's, well, it's ex the exciting news uh, for us is that we are moving to Australia in September. Uh, I'm taking up a role in a church I used to be part of uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, I'm going to be taking overseeing their, their worship, their creative art um, department, and also their evening congregation pastor, and also thinking through some of their church planning stuff as well. That's amazing. That's exciting, is that? Let's give them a big clap. So um, just tell us when this is actually going to be happening. Megan, what's, um, when, is, when is all this taking place? When? Uh, some mid-September. Oh, we don't have a date yet. So, yeah. so there's lots of kind of planning and preparation for you guys as you um, plan to go back to Australia, but also just planning and preparations for um, the future of the worship and, yeah. and so on. Just tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think for, what's really exciting for... I mean, it is exciting, but it's very sad. I think we'd, we'd, it's been a very difficult decision for both of us because... This is our home, and this is where we met, uh, have married, and have had our two children, and and so it has been. It's definitely been something that we have struggled to to, to kind of come to. So it's, it is definitely a bit of sweet time for us, and processing that is is not easy. Um, I guess what's exciting for, for for us is is thinking about some of the stuff that we've been doing here, and just taking it back to Australia. To be honest, so the things that we've kind of learnt here. Um, kind of making all the mistakes on you guys, really, um, when it comes to worship, when it comes to the evening service here and just trying different things um, and taking that back to a, a context. When I came to England 10 years ago, I remember I, I flew with a guy called Mike Pilavachi and I just chewed his ear off the whole time saying, I want to see a, a charismatic expression of church in Australia. And I think what we've, and what I've been doing here, what we've been doing here is just exactly that. We've, it's been such a training Grand for us and under under you, Rick and Louis, it's been such a blessing. So, all that to say, and to take the church planning stuff as well. So, the the plan is the conversation is that we will will plant a church in a couple of years' time out of this church. They've been really gracious to kind of enter those conversations. Um, so we'll be in definite contact. And if anyone wants to move out to Brisbane, Australia, in a couple of years' time, then just come and speak to us. <laughs> what an invitation! <laughs> Well, um, they're not going yet, which is really great. But obviously, it's um, massively sad for us um, to be sending them um, away from here as a church community. But what a privilege as well to be able to do that. And so um, in these next few months, we're going to be um, uh, interviewing worship leaders and just um, praying for the right um, person, people to be um, uh, taking on what they've um, left you know, what they've kind of built up. And also there are just lots and lots of opportunities in the Connect group that they've been running, the evening service and so on, the prayer life. All of these things will need to be um, led um, into the future. So would you please pray um, for over the next few months for these things? In fact, we'll pray now, um, but we it would be just wonderful to just say thank you and just acknowledge how amazing these guys are because they are amazing. And so thank you. And... Um, Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for um, Andrew and Megan, their children. Lord, thank you for um, all that you've been doing in them and through them in our church. Lord, thank you. They're very much part of us and that we've been formed in part by um, all that they've brought. And we pray, Lord, for them as they uh, make plans and preparations for September going back or going to Australia and we pray that you would um, help them in all of those things. We pray as well for the um, the ministries that are uh, that they've been involved in leading here, Lord, that you would raise up the right people to take those on and to, to take us on from where we are into the next stage of um, our life as a church. Um, we pray you bless that process. We invite you, Lord, to take command and control of that area of these um, spaces that are great opportunities for people to step into. And we commit um, the, uh, these areas to you in the life of the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys, very much indeed. It's wonderful. Um, and, um, yeah, they haven't left. How are we doing? Good. Good. You sure? Oh, there we go. I'm now louder. I'll say that again. How are you doing? 
you can be louder too, that's good. We are uh, in the third part of a series uh, where we're looking at the prayers that Paul prayed for the churches that he planted, uh, that he was related to, and uh, this is uh, the third in that series, and we're looking at the church in Colossae, the Colossians, and it's a really simple prayer. It's one petition, and it has one purpose But before we look at it, we're actually going to pray ourselves. We've been doing a little bit of that this morning. We're going to do some more. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We thank you that you're a God who is not distant or remote, but that you are close, you are near, and you are passionate about us, and you speak to us. And as we uh, explore what it means to be on our knees before you, seeking your face, dependent on you. Lord, we pray that we might hear your voice and uh, together uh, go deeper into that relationship with you that we are so privileged to be able to have. So come Holy Spirit, we pray, uh, help us to see uh, what you're doing, help us to hear what you're saying to us in Jesus' name, amen. Do you know what we've just done there, praying, is something that a remarkable number of people actually do. You may be surprised to hear that. You may think that prayer is dying out. Well, it is not. In the 2011 UK census, we discovered that 16% of the entire population of the UK pray every single day. That is about 9 million people. That's a lot of people, isn't it? 12%, a further 12% of people say that they pray several times a week. That's one in eight people pray on a regular basis, more than once a week. 4% on top of that say that they pray once a week. That's one in 25. And so what you've got there is 30% of people in the entire UK, one in three of us, about 18 million people pray at least once a week. Does that sound good to you? I thought that was pretty good myself. And you can pat yourselves on the back even more because we live in London, and London is the prayer capital of the United Kingdom. So 73% of Londoners pray on a weekly basis. I wonder if 73% of us pray on a weekly basis. But uh, only 29% say that they never pray. 29%. And... A little smile on my face when I read this. 12% of those who would say, I have no faith, admit to praying sometimes. I don't really understand that. I wonder who they think they are praying to. But what are these millions of people actually praying for? Well, 68% of these prayers pray for their friends and their family. 41% of them thank God on a regular basis for the success and the achievement in their lives. 32% of us pray for guidance. 26% of us pray for healing for uh, ourselves and for our relatives. And the other 25% 25 of us pray for world peace. Quite a broad range. I wonder, what about you? What do you spend most of your time praying for when you pray? And I wonder, does it look like the sort of things that Paul prays for when he prays? And we're going to look at three uh, things this morning. We're going to look at, uh, from this particular prayer, we're going to look at uh, know what he wants, do what you know, and pray what you do. What am I going on about? Let's start with know what he wants. Because the truth is, just like that list, most of us pray for what we want, don't we? There's a great story uh, uh, set on the 8th of December 1944 in the battlefields of France. And uh, James O'Neill, the chief chaplain of the Allied Third Army, picks up the phone first thing in the morning. This is General Patton. Do you have a good prayer for weather? We must do something about those rains if we are to win the war. It was raining outside. He didn't have a prayer. So he wrote one. 
and had 250,000 of these prayers printed onto postcards with a little Christmas greeting from the general on the back with a signature. And he distributed them to the entire Third Army. And this is how that prayer went. Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee that armed with thy power we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Patton spoke to this chaplain afterwards and said to him, Chaplain, I am a strong believer in prayer. There are three ways that men get what they want. Planning, working, praying. That's how we get what we want. And of course, moments, they matter to us. That's when we pray so often, isn't it? In an instant, at a life stage, where our lives we know are going to change, where perhaps we're pursuing a dream or we've got a decision to make, we're at a crossroads in life. Maybe that's our career. Maybe that's who are we going to marry or whether we're going to get married. Maybe it's a decision about where we should live or what church we should go to, how we should spend our money. Those motivate us to pray, don't they? Those moments... But it's not just moments in life, it's also needs that we feel. And they can make us desperate in our prayers and specific. It might be a tragedy, an illness, or perhaps a moral failure in our lives. It might be an obstacle or pressure that we feel or, or even disappointment or boredom. You know, we're at work and we think, God, what am I doing here? This is so boring. I'm at such a dead end in my life. And we pray for what we want. Is that how you pray? Do you pray, on the whole, for what you want? Do you ask God for help to get what you want? I do, most of the time. That's how I pray. But Paul here doesn't. Paul prays for what God wants. So he doesn't pray for what the Colossians want. He doesn't even ask them. Instead, he prays for one thing. It's a really simple prayer. One petition, one thing. And he says he prays consistently, continuously, again and again. He hasn't stopped praying this one thing for these Christians. And what is that one thing? He says there is one thing that we need to pray all the time. And it is this. He prays that they may know what God wants, what his will is for their lives. So Paul prays for what God wants. Now, it's not wrong to pray for the things that we want in our lives. Jesus tells us to do that. Those moments where we're at a crossroads, those needs that we feel so acutely, they really matter. But they mustn't dominate our prayer life. Actually, we need to pray primarily for what God wants in our lives. So know what he wants. Now, you're probably sitting there going, thanks, Rod, that's great. How do I know what he wants in my life? How do you know what God's will is for your life? What is the second thing I want to say this morning? Do what you know. If we're honest... God's will, it feels like a mystery, doesn't it, to us? Discovering God's will seems to be incredibly difficult. It feels like we're looking for the right pathway in a maze that we're lost in. Or it's sitting down each week with a scratch card, hoping we're going to win the lottery, but it never seems to quite come up. Or perhaps it's sitting there on a Monday morning looking at the stocks and shares as they go up and down and wondering where your investments are and whether you've made the right ones or not. Or perhaps it's simply on a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday morning you're sitting reading and kind of puzzling your way through the cryptic crossword in the newspaper. It seems inscrutable, it's difficult, it's an effort, it's a mystery. 
And so we try everything, don't we, to work out what God's will might be for our lives. We dream dreams. We hope for visions. We look for signs or impressions or feelings. We put out fleeces, you know, that old evangelical favorite. We say, God, if I do this and this happens, then it must mean this. I remember my old RE teacher said um, he, was, he was flying out to the US and uh, he had a huge decision to make in his life. Was he to marry this woman he had been dating? He wasn't sure. He was a bit awkward socially, I remember. And, uh, and so he needed courage to pop the question. And he thought to himself, I've got to put out a fleece. I've got to ask for something that uh, could just never happen unless God was sending me a direct message. And so he said, Lord, if she meets me at the foot of the uh, steps out of the plane with a strawberry cheesecake in her hands, (laughs) then I will believe she is the woman that I am to marry. And that happened. How awesome is that? (laughs) Um, And they were married, and he was telling that story several years afterwards. But it doesn't often happen like that, does it? And it can leave us, that sort of quest can leave us feeling frustrated, and sometimes confused, often even paralyzed. We're frustrated because we think, God, why is it so difficult to work out what you're saying about my life? We can be confused because we think, how can I make a decision solely based on what seems to be feelings or just a sense, an instinct, that my gut, or or maybe just a sense of peace about something? And it can leave us obsessed with the future where we become paralyzed because we think to ourselves, I've missed my moment. I have chosen this path and God's will has gone off in a different path and that's my life over. We feel that God's will is a mystery. But I want to tell you this morning that God's will is not a mystery. And you might be disappointed to hear that. You might be one of those people that loves mysteries. I, uh, I'm one of those people that loves mystery, so I was raving about this great TV series uh, we've been watching recently, Broad Church, introduced by my mother-in-law, Maureen, who's over there this morning. And uh, I said to the uh, staff team on uh, Tuesday, guys, anybody seen Broad Church? 30 people in the room, none of them had seen it. If you haven't seen it, watch it, because it's fantastic, and it's a brilliant mystery. And we love mysteries, we love puzzles, we love riddles, conundrums, enigmas, all of those things fascinate us as human beings. But God's will is none of those things. In fact, I am confident enough to make a very, very bold assertion about your life this morning. Are you ready? Yeah, you ready? I know what God's will is for your life. I do. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, I know what God's will is for your life. Do you believe me? Or you should, because it's right here. Verse 10, clear as anything. God's will for your life, to live a life worthy of the Lord and to please him in every way. That is what he wants. That is his will for your life. So for Paul, when he talks about, he, he prays for the Colossians to know the will of God, he is effectively saying, I want you to obey his commands. He says it in his letter, another letter to the Thessalonians, chapter four, verse three of his first letter. He says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. The Old Testament is exactly the same. When the psalmist in Psalm 143 uh, writes, he writes, not teach me your will, but teach me to do your will. His will has been revealed to us. We know what he wants. To know his will is to lead a life worthy of the Lord, a life that pleases him. 
And you might say, hang on a second, that doesn't really help me with my decision making. But it does help you with your decision making, I think, because it makes decision making easy. There is one single criteria for every single decision you need to make in your life. And that is, what does that decision do to your character? So when you have two houses to buy, or you're thinking, do I buy this one, or do I continue to rent? Ask, how will it impact your character? When you're looking for the right person to marry, ask, should I get married? Will it make me holy? Because that's what it's there for. When you're looking for a job, is it a job that will make you holy? to give you opportunities to serve so that your heart is changed and transformed from the inside out. Because the truth is, your character and your conduct matter much more to God than those life choices that you find yourself having to make in, uh, as you go through your life. And what Paul says here, which is hugely encouraging, I think, is that the more you do it, the easier it actually gets. Do you notice Paul's logic here? He prays that they may know God's will so that they may live worthy lives. And then he defines that worthy life a little bit further on. And one of the uh, definitions of that worthy life is that you grow in the knowledge of God. It becomes a wonderful virtuous circle. Do what you know to discern better what you don't. It's very practical. God wants you to live a worthy life that pleases him. Do what you know. So, know what he wants. Do what you know. Thirdly, pray what you do. Do you notice here in this prayer how Paul makes no demands on the Colossian Christians? You know, doing the will of God is not an easy thing, is it? We know that. We want to do what God wants, but there's a huge part of us that doesn't want to do what God wants either because we don't like being told what to do. And so we try, we stir it up within ourselves with our determination and resolve, our our kind of willpower. And yet again and again, we find ourselves failing and we end up doing what we want to do. And what we want to do is not always what God wants to do. And often the best that we can do is pray, actually, that God helps us with what we want to do. And we can find ourselves in this endless cycle that can leave us feeling full of shame and guilt. But Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't command them. He doesn't make a demand on them. Instead, he prays for them. He specifically prays for the Colossians. He says, I know what a worthy life that pleases God looks like. And he doesn't say, so get on with it, do it. He prays for them. He prays for it. And he prays for things that I'm just going to whiz through really briefly. He prays, first of all, that the Colossians taste good. He wants them to taste good. He says a worthy life is fruitful. So he prays that they might be fruitful. He knows that Jesus makes you and me different. He knows that others will notice the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he knows that only God can do that. So he prays. And we need to pray that we taste good. Paul prays, secondly, that they might learn more. He says that he knows that a worthy life is growing in the knowledge of God. It's not resting on its laurels. It's not saying, well, I used to be into the Bible, you know, when I, in the first couple of years after I became a Christian, now it's got a little bit boring and I don't read it that often. I certainly don't study it. No, it's a, it's a, a life that is growing in its knowledge of God. Not just knowing God, but knowing about God. Those two things inform each other. Paul prays that they are learning more. Thirdly, Paul prays that they stay strong. Do you notice here, he doesn't pray for deliverance. It's really interesting. He prays for endurance and patience. He prays for power. Out of God's glorious riches. An extraordinary prayer. 
Why do we get that power? So that we can endure, so that we have fortitude and stamina in the face of suffering, all that life throws at us. And then fourthly, he prays that they enjoy themselves. What a great prayer that is. Whatever we need, wherever we are in life, whatever decision we have to make, Paul prays for our joy, that we enjoy ourselves. And that joy is rooted for Paul in gratitude, in an attitude of thankfulness. Do you notice there I avoided saying an attitude of gratitude? But if you want to remember it that way, you can. It is joy that is rooted in real, genuine thankfulness. He knows, you see, that he has been rescued. He knows that he's been redeemed. He knows that he has been forgiven. It is not what he has done as an obedient follower of Jesus. It is what God has done for him in Jesus. And is what God is doing in him now through the Holy Spirit. Paul understands this belief he has in Jesus is not self-help. It's not self-improvement. It's not therapy either. It is salvation. And so Paul prays for all of these things because he knows that God does it all. He knows that God saves us. He knows that God changes us. So he doesn't command us. Instead, he says, pray what you do. So three things from this simple prayer of Paul this morning. Know what he wants. Do what you know. Pray what you do. And if you do that, you will find that you are focusing your prayer life like a laser. It will become razor sharp and hugely effective Because you are praying for what God wants in your life and in the lives of those around you. So pray that your life is worthy of him. Pray that you taste good. Pray that you learn more. Pray that you stay strong. Pray that you enjoy yourself. And I'd love us just to have a moment where we do that, if that's all right. So, what we're going to do is this, really briefly, and I'll hand over to Rick. I want you to think to yourself, what what area of those things that God is talking about when he says, this is what a worthy life looks like, this is what a life pleasing to God looks like, do I want more of right now, because that is what God is saying to me. So I'm just going to pray for us, that God speaks to us and just says, this is where I want you to grow. And then what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to say, do you want to taste good? And if you think, yes, I want to taste good, then I'm going to ask you to stand. If, you, if I'm going to say, do you want to learn more? And if you want to learn more in your knowledge of God, I'm going to ask you to stand and so on until perhaps we're all standing. The band are just going to come up as we do that. But let me pray for us.